In this video, I'm going to show you how to nail the right cutter every time. For many beginners, cutter mixing is quite tricky and they feel that they can never find the right cutter. The thing is, you can't really find the right cutter. It's very much like aiming a bow. There's very little chance that you'll hit dead center on your first arrow. So what you have to learn, in fact, is to progressively improve your aim to get closer and closer to your target. And with cutter mixing, it's pretty much the same. You have to learn how to navigate the cutter wheel to adjust your aim and get closer and closer to your target cutter every time. So let's first cover some important vocabulary in technical terms, because for figurative painting, it's not just about reproducing one single cutter but reproducing a range of values that give an accurate representation of the volume of a given object in this case it's this green sphere but it could be anything the most important one if you want to rematch the cutter of this sphere is this one and we're going to call this one the local Cutter. The local cutter is the cutter of the object unaffected by strong lights or shadows. It's the normal cutter of the object. Next, this is the highlight. And the highlight is a reflection of the light source on the surface of the object. Imagine that my light source is red. In this case, the highlight would be red or reddish. The size, the aspect of this specular highlight really depends on the aspect of the object, whether it's glossy or matte. If it's glossy, the highlight is going to look sharper and it's going to feel more like a direct reflection, like, almost like a mirrored surface. And if it's very matte, it's going to look more scattered and more diffuse at the surface, even to a point that you can not see a highlight. So glossy means more highlight and matte means less visible highlight cutter. Next, we have the midtones, sometimes called half tones. In this category, you have the dark midtones, so those who go more towards the shadows, and you have the light midtones, so those who go more towards the highlight. The success of the three dimensionality of your painting is going to be all about how the midtones articulate and how you blend the midtones into each other and how accurately do you represent the midtones. So, as long as your local color is on point, getting the midtones right is pretty simple. You just have to make them darker or lighter from there. Next, we have the shadows, and the most important part of the shadow is this line here which is the limit, the frontier between the light side and the shadow side. This one is sometimes called the terminator line or the bed bug line. And it is typically the darkest type of green that you would get on this entire sphere. In this case, there would be no green that would be darker than this line because it receives the less light. After that, in the shadow, you also have the core shadow, which is shadows that are visible on the surface of the object. And you also have here the cast shadow, which is a shadow that's on the surface, so on the ground or on this surface here. Here it's not really visible because the ground is all black, so you don't have a very visible cast shadow, but it's there. And within the core shadow, you also have reflected lights. In this case, there is not a lot of reflected light because it's all black around, so the light can't really bounce around in the other surfaces. But the color and the aspect of the reflected light really depends on the type of surface that the light is reflected on. So if you have a red reflective surface here, the reflected light would be red. When I say that it would be red, it wouldn't be exactly red. It would be kind of a mix between the red of the reflective surface and the green of the object in this case. Now that we have most of the technical terms out of the way, let's see how we would mix a green to match this one. All right, so first, what pigments do you need on your palette? Well, in theory, you should be able to mix with any pigments, as long, of course, as you have a balanced selection that covers most of the cutter wheel. 
what I normally recommend is this list of pigments, but really it doesn't matter that you get exactly the same pigments as I do. What matters is that your selection can easily cover the entire range of cutters without holes. So you want one cutter from each big family. So one cutter from the red, one cutter from the orange, the yellow orange, one cutter from the green family, one cutter from the cyan, very important in my opinion, one cutter from the blue, one cutter from the magenta purple range. And then of course a couple useful pigments after that, a good brown, I recommend burnt umber, but also raw umber can be very useful. Burnt sienna can be a very useful earth cutter that matches very well with the color of the skin and obviously a white and a black. So feel free to refer to this list of pigments if you want. I found that this one works really well for me, but really it's not about exactly getting the right pigments, but more how to go from one color to the other with the pigments that you have. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All these cutter resources are from my cutter course. So if you want to learn more and if you want to get my cutter PDF with all the cutter wheels, the link is in the description. You will also find the link to my cutter theory course with everything you need to know about cutter. To understand what I'm going to be talking about, you need to understand the difference between hue value and chroma. Seriously, I've been talking about this so much that I'm not going to explain it again, but here's a very simple illustration of the difference between the three. Okay, so let's mix a green to try to match this. We're going to do two situations, one where we actually have a green pigment and we're going to try to find which one would be best with like four possible pigments. And we'll also try to mix this green sphere without a green pigment. But let's start. Let's imagine that we have four green pigments that's more than enough to mix what we want. But let's see which one would be the best here in this case. We have some phalo green yellow shade here. We have some Prussian green PG7 here. We have some sap green here. And we have some green earth here. I can almost guarantee that the green earth will not be the best, but well, it's just all the greens that I have, right? If you really know your pigments well, you understand before you even need to do anything which one would work best in this case. But what I do recommend, if you're not sure, is simply to add a little touch of white to see the undertone of the pigment because it's really going to make a, a whole lot of difference. And of course, mixing pigments, you're not only considering how the pigment looks, but also different properties like the drying time, stuff like that. So I know it sounds silly, but sometimes the color itself is not the only thing that you consider when picking a candidate pigment. In this case, our phalo green yellow shade is definitely what we need. You can already see that it's slightly too bluish. So if we want to make this sphere look right, we're going to need some yellow. Okay, now we have our pigment. Let's put this one on the side and let's see a different situation where we don't have a green pigment at all and we have to mix it from scratch. First, let's try those pigments and see how they work. This is PY40 Aurelian and this is Cerulean Blue PB35. Can they actually match this pretty strong, vivid, bright green? Are they powerful enough? Do they have enough tinting strengths? Do they have enough cuttering power to match this high chroma cutter. All right, so I need less blue and let's try to mix with the Oriolin. And ah man, in this case, I don't think these cutters would work because there's just not enough tinting strength here to match this, this cutter. It goes more towards the dull side. The, the Oriolin is not strong enough and the cerulean blue is not chromatic enough so the only thing that i can get is a very dull green there's no way i can match this and i can't really adjust to this color so in this case now nah, this wouldn't work obviously it would work if i added some of my phalo green here so these three pigments, they could work together, but in our case, we've decided that we wanted to pretend that we don't have a green. So let's see if we can make it work with more powerful pigments. I have some cadmium yellow light here and some phalo turquoise here. So this is not a blue in this case, it's a cyan. 
and let's try to mix them and they should give me something much stronger something that's approaching my uh my green here and you can see it's almost a perfect match immediately almost immediately a perfect match i can just add a touch of white and i'm almost getting the perfect the perfect color here so i'm lucky this shows you the importance of getting strong powerful pigments if you want to get objects that are vivid like this green sphere here you really want some potent pigments and colors that are more dull will not give you the ability to mix the full range all right so let's just keep on mixing then i think I nailed this one, so I'm gonna leave this one on the side. This one is pretty much done, and you see how easy it is if you have strong, powerful pigments, cadmium yellow, very powerful, and uh, and phalo, phalo turquoise, very powerful as well. And in reality, there is not such a big difference between the phalo green and the phalo cyan here. Um, this is just a mix of phalo green and phalo blue in this case. So really, we are using almost the same pigments and the real difference comes from the yellow that I've chosen. And as you can see, it's also very easy to match in this case. So I'm adding a bit of white to make it both lighter and also um, make it less chromatic. If I want to push the chroma, I'm going to add yellow. And if I want to make it less chromatic, I'm gonna make it, uh, I'm gonna mix with a little bit of white. All right, so we have step one down, finding the right pigment. Next is mixing the local color. And now we're gonna mix the full range of values from the shadows to the highlights. So the thing is, we're gonna mix a whole scale and we're gonna try to keep this green color in mind without losing it the more we mix the more we'll have a tendency to lose the color and we want to always make sure that we stay on track and what i recommend is to ask yourself three questions and the three questions are in this order what's the difference in hue what's the difference in value and what's the difference in chroma so i'm going to try to make a value scale of five different hues for this one the highlight is pretty much all almost all white not pure white but very very white because it's a reflection of the light source the more reflective your surface is the more similar to the light source the highlight will be now i'm going to try to mix some light half tones so first i think that in this case what i'm getting here well the three questions the difference in hue is way too blue so uh, I need to add more yellow in this case. So I'm adding the yellow, definitely adding the yellow. Now I can see that the difference in value, it's not big enough, I want it to be lighter. So I'm gonna add some white. Now I can realize that there is actually still a difference in, in hue that's too big, it's too yellow, so I'm gonna add a, a small touch, a pinch of cyan again. A bit more. And I'm always asking the question questions in this order. Comparing to my surface, this here. Here's still too yellow, so I'm gonna add a touch of cyan, touch of white. bit more white make it lighter now I'm I'm focusing on the difference in value and in the end uh, the difference in chroma with my model here it should be probably so I'm adding a bit more yellow because the difference in chroma is too big and a bit more of this turquoise turquoise again so if I add too much white at some point the, the chroma might drop significantly so keep in mind that you should always be adding some actual color the yellow and the turquoise here 
are the core of the coloring potential of my mix. So if I add only white, I'm losing them. Now it's time to add some shadow colors. So let's do that. And the shadow colors. I'm using black in this case because I'm using black in combination with some of this turquoise. So it works uh, pretty well. Here, the difference in hue is too big. It's too much on the cyan turquoise side. Chroma is a bit too big. So to reduce the chroma, I add a bit more ivory black again. So I have something approaching my shadow cutter here. Maybe I'm going to add a bit more yellow. And if the chroma is still too high, I can add a touch of black because the black has had a tendency to make everything a little bit more dull and as you go more towards the shadows the chroma is naturally reduced so that's normally what you want you'd want too big of a chroma in the shadows and here for the cast shadow uh, it's pretty simple it would almost be gray almost pure black black and white. The cast shadow is actually on my gray surface here, so there is no green in there. Aiming for the right color is always the same. It's always pick a color that you're going to aim for. So for example, the highlight here, or the light mid-tone, or the dark mid-tone, or the terminator line, or the shadow, the cast shadow, the core shadow, the reflected lights. You aim for the right thing, you try to locate it on your object and you then just make your mix. You simply take a little sample on your palette knife and try to see if they match. All right, so that's my technique to nail the right cutter every time, my friends. Hue, value, chroma, get it in this order. And seriously, this technique really helps. And if it helped you, leave a like. All right, I'll see you for the next one, my friends. And as always, joy and inspiration to you. Bye.